ideas and what a beautiful start to today's event. Um, my name's Lizzie Spencer and I'm a lecturer in the Department of History at York um, and I'm going to be chairing today's event. And it's really my great pleasure to welcome you in person and particularly in such beautiful surroundings. Um, before I introduce us to our fantastic speaker, however, I'd like to just draw your attention to the evacuation slide on the screen, which is hopefully appearing. We'll skip past it. Okay, um, well, in the, in the case of, in the, in the unlikely event of an emergency, um, please just follow the steward's directions and instructions and evacuate the venue um, via the closest available exit. Please, can I also ask that you make sure that your phones are on silent for the duration of today's event? So it's my very, very great pleasure to introduce John Callow, um, who is today's speaker. John is an honorary research fellow at the University of Suffolk. He's written widely on early modern witchcraft, politics, and popular culture. He's the author of The Making of King James II and Embracing the Darkness. John's also appeared on the BBC4 radio um, documentary, It Must Be Witchcraft, and the series on the Salem Witches on the Discovery Channel. And The Last Witches um, of England is his most recent book. And we're really delighted that he's joining us today to talk about The Last Witches of England, um, a really richly um, researched study which tells the story of three women from Bideford who came to be forever defined as witches. Um, and without further ado, please let me hand over to John um, to tell us more about it. Thank you. On the 29th of June, 1682, a magpie came tapping and rapping and gasping at a window of a shopkeeper in Biddeford, in Devon. It couldn't have made its appearance at a worse time and could never have known the cycle of events that it was going to trigger. It managed to gain entrance to an open window and found something shiny, probably within the chamber, and disturbed in its passage a couple of women who were making up the room. It had been a terrible night in the East Church house, and the house itself was a particularly unhappy place. Grace Thomas, the unmarried sister-in-law of Thomas East Church, the owner, had taken to her bed some months previously. Nobody could find any kind of remedy, any medical answer, to what ailed her. She'd been at the point of death several times. She'd complained of pins and pricks, burning sensations that took hold of her, racked her body, made her shiver through the long nights. She'd gone through a particularly bad night previously and had just felt somewhat better. The magpie's arrival shattered the temporary calm. The women making up the chamber ran to and fro, the bird, as you can imagine, became far more frantic in its attempts to escape back out of the window. There were shrieks, shouting, probably some shed feathers. And after half an hour or so, the family began to calm down again. The bird had finally made its exit. They were shattered, they were tired, roomy and red-eyed. And they began to discuss something of the nature of the afflictions of the household it would probably have never gone any further. We'd never have heard of the magpie, never heard of Thomas East Church and his wife, Elizabeth, or of Grace Thomas, her invalid sister, were it not for another scratching that suddenly came under the eaves. The door was flung open by the master of the house, and a figure in rags and tatters started up as scared, as frightful, as bedazed as had been the bird, turned on its heels and ran straight down the street. That woman was Temperance Lloyd, one of the key figures in our story, the story of three poor women at Biddeford that I'm going to set out for you today in the next 40 or so minutes. Um, and what happened when, again, the household had calmed down was that they began to relate the appearance of the beggar woman, Temperance, with the appearance of the magpie. Soon it began to seem as if they were one and the same entity, that the woman possibly somehow had transformed from out of the magpie, was fulfilling the same functions, eavesdropping, not being where she was supposed to be, 
And if there was anything about the story I'm going to tell you and about what Biddeford was like in the 1680s, nobody in Biddeford was what they were supposed to be or precisely where they were supposed to be or doing what they should have been. It unites absolutely everybody from the absent squire who'd gone off to court and let things slide to the clergyman who was not actually a clergyman, who was an absentee, to the people who filled the void and the justices. Everything was turned upside down. So the household quickly come to this remarkable conclusion that the magpie's actions were linked with the witch, the witch who was Temperance Lloyd. There is a magical explanation. I'm going to see how they might have arrived at that in a minute or two. And that is the beginning of the chain of events that created the Biddeford witches. The cause and the effect being mirrored, the assumption that the magpie wasn't a stray bird, it was actually an agent of the devil himself, and the witch was his agent. Why did they think that Temperance Lloyd was a witch? Why did they think that Susanna Edwards or Mary Trembles, the two women who stood charged with her, were witches? Well, it's a story, I think, rooted in misfortune, in terrible, terrible bad luck, in witch belief itself, and in the particular circumstances that led Biddeford to be the scene of the last outbreak of witchcraft that resulted we know of for sure, in capital convictions and hanging in England. Carry on somewhat later in Scotland. Why did this happen? Because Biddeford, <laughs> Biddeford doesn't fit. Nothing about the story fits in what we think of when we think about witchcraft. It's remarkably late. If you think in the popular imagination about witchcraft, it tends to be assumed that it's a rural phenomena, that the charges are formed by people who are unle unlettered, uninformed, let's be frank about it, fairly stupid, and that it is born out of poverty rather than affluence. Well, Biddeford comes really late. The charges are formed in 1682. This is the age of the Royal Society, of Cartesian thought, of John Locke in politics, of Newton beginning to work away on physics, and upon the Royal Society. Charles II is on the throne. So these people are appreciably modern. They've crossed that watershed of the mid-17th century. How can it be that witchcraft lingers here and has this devastating effect? The community is urban, sophisticated, cosmopolitan, Biddeford had built its wealth, and it really did have wealth at this period, on a trading empire that meant that its citizens had far more in common with the people from Holland working um, the Newfoundland fisheries in the north, or the American settlers along the Chesapeake Bay than they probably did have with people in other parts of Devon, in Plymouth, because road transport was so poor, and the sea lanes brought Biddeford its prosperity. It was the big tobacco port. Slavery, fortunately, had not yet taken hold. It takes another generation for that to take root, like the worm in the bud in Bristol. So it's tobacco that makes the money along with codfish, and it is the second biggest entrepot for tobacco in the British Isles. So it's massively connected on trade. It also produces absenteeism. Lots of the men are away on voyages, so the women fill the void. Lots of alehouses um, that are run by women folk. So there's female agency from there. Of course, what is happening at the same time amid the prosperity of, the, of Biddeford and its redevelopment is that the, the town cannot cope that hogs, and they always turn up in the town records, there are always hogs running around and various kind of town ordinances about people keeping their pigs and not letting them run along the quayside. There are lots of scavengers, lots of birds, lots of rats, obviously. And there's this sense that these scavenging little animals, feral cats that appear later in the story, 
are fulfilling the same role as the Biddeford witches. They're gaining entrance into the hearth and into the home. They're squeezing their way through the gaps. Or as we saw with Temperance Lloyd, they're listening at the eaves. They're routing out food. They're looking for charity. All the things that are mirrored in the poor and our three poor women of Biddeford. So who are they? We've got Temperance Lloyd, who's known in the pamphlet literature as the Grand Dame Witch. There was no doubt in contemporaries that she was the main figure. All eyes were on her. She was more vocal than the others. She was more dominant. Um, she'd, she was an immigrant, as far as we know, to the town. She came from a Welsh background. She was originally Temperance Jones, probably, as her name suggests, from a good Puritan background. She settles there in the Welsh community that are brought in during the civil wars to mine the anthracite coal for Biddeford. Biddeford has cannon foundry. It's got shipwrights alongside Appledore, just down the, the River Torridge there. Um, so she settles as part of a thriving Welsh community. She probably was a Welsh speaker. Certainly the town clerk had difficulty recording Welsh names in his records, and so did the parish clerk. They conflate them, they very often don't get them right, you get lots of weird spellings about the Welsh community. The point is that by 1664, the mine has been run out. There's no more coal to mine. The Welsh begin to drift away, and Temperance's husband goes as well. There's no evidence that he died. She's never styled as the Widow Lloyd, as are some of her other sisters in the Poor Law books, or as Susanna Edwards was. So she's an abandoned woman, and she goes on to the parish charity. She's ranked initially as one of the deserving poor. She is, after all, a Protestant, and that's something all these three women have in common. So there are arms to be given, but she falls onto begging pretty quickly of more later. The other two women, well, we have Susanna Edwards, who was slightly younger. The other thing to say is, when you look at the old accounts about all of this, Temperance Lloyd is seen as being incredibly old, 84, 79, all these ages are bandied about. Actually, she was probably in her late 60s. The, the, the effect of begging of hard manual labour had wizened her. One of the North brothers writes a famous account, it's one of the primary sources for the witches, where he sees them at the trial where his brother, Lord North, is deliberating. And he says, had a painter wanted to scour the entire kingdoms of England, Scotland and Ireland for three more miserable, beaten down, garrulous creatures who would look the very part of witches for his canvas, you could not find better than the three women I saw in the courtroom. That's as near as a pen portrait as we get of them. So they're broken and ground down by poverty. Temperance Lloyd is a lot younger than people at the time or since have actually thought she was. The second, wo the second woman, uh, Susanna Edwards, in a way had fallen the furthest. She doesn't have a great start in life. She's illegitimate. And her f extended family account, as far as I can work out, because the figures don't, you know, the figures aren't full, but they account for about a, the, the third known, a third of the known illegitimate births registered in Biddeford during the period we're looking at. So the family are dysfunctional in all kinds of ways. However, she makes a relatively good match within the town. She raises a family, unfortunately, just as the plague strikes and the plague carries off some of her kids her husband dies, and she's thrown onto the charity of the parish. So from being somebody who, like Temperance Lloyd, was initially respectable, she has a long way to fall. The third of the trio really is the one we know less about, Mary Trembles, um, who is just plain unfortunate. She's almost the silent witness in our story. The other two, we've got great passages of their speech, the things they said when they were accused. We get some kind of sense of their character. We don't do that with Mary. She was the child of beggars. She was born among the indigent poor. Mum and Dad, Dad had the amazing name of Trojan 
trembles. And sometimes in the poor law records, it becomes tridging. And with a lot of the indigent poor in Biddeford, you get almost these nicknames, these corruptions, that suggest what they actually did. So the idea of the trudging man with the sack on his back is something we get, certainly, for her father. So she'd known nothing but begging all her life long. She's unmarried. The other two had had physical relationships. As far as we know, she is the dependent of mum and dad who had died four or five years before she's actually accused of being a witch. So she's... And she comes from an Irish background, north of Ireland, again, almost certainly a Protestant family, as far as we, as far as we know. How do they get the name of witches? Well, through sheer bad luck in some cases. In the breakdown of charity in the early modern era, because the great religious houses, you know, we're in York, Margaret of Clitheroe, we've got this sense of Catholic charity that existed in the Middle Ages. That's all gone at the Reformation. It becomes a private preserve. There isn't the emphasis. It's not the... It's not the idea of good works getting you into heaven. Biddeford is lucky that it has maybe as many as 16 private charities. We've only, though, this is terms of sources and how we get to all of this, that I can maybe say a bit more about in the Q&A, we've only got one of the surviving doll registers for the John Andrew Fund. And it has to be said, without looking at that, the book I've written would be really, really different because you get a sense of what it was like to be poor in Biddeford. You get the sense of how these women begged in sisterly groups. Now, it doesn't take two seconds thought to think that women on the streets then as now are vulnerable for all kinds of reasons to assault and all kinds of abuse. If you're begging with your sister, you've got an element of protection. So sometimes in the doll book you get the records of a pair of women coming in for relief. You get the wonderful entry, the moving entry about Michaelmas 1681, where the three women are all lined up together in the line. So you can say at that point, they went in the door of John Andrew's former home and received their doll, stood in the line next to each other, so they know each other. There are a lot of poor in Biddeford, it's a boom town, it's a place of vast wealth, but without a welfare state, it's also a place with absolutely no safety net. And if you're vulnerable, if you're old, if you're poor, if you're a woman, and if you're a woman without a man, you've got very, very little agency. And that is what marginalises these three women. They're on the parish. Tem and, and actually, we talk about the Biddeford witches as if they're a unit. They're not. There is Temperance Lloyd, who is on her own, and there is Mary Trembles and Susanna Edwards, who have a friendship, who sometimes go about the place begging together. Okay? There's nothing to unite them but the charges. And there were other women who were accused of witchcraft in Biddeford, which I'll maybe allude to later. So the, 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 the trials could have spread if they hadn't have been halted. What gets them to be witches? Well, sheer bad luck in the first case. Um, and it is something that had been brewing in the case of Temperance Lloyd for a very, very, very long time. She's first accused of witchcraft in 1671, tried at Exeter, and acquitted on that occasion, she denies the charges, and that's really significant for what happens afterwards. She's accused again in 1679. Again, this time, a child had died of smallpox. Um, there's pressure on the mother to accuse Lloyd. The father just basically says it was smallpox. You know, it was the will of God, and, you know, this thing happened. And that, that charge doesn't go anywhere. 1682, though, she's unlucky. It, it's literally three strikes and you're out. And funnily enough, if you look at early modern committals, very often, and Robin Briggs wrote a great book about this, uh, Witches as Neighbours, it's neighbourly tensions that simmer like a, like a boiling cooking pot for a long, long, long time. This is precisely what had been happening in Biddeford. This time, Grace Edwards had, sorry, um, Grace Thomas had fallen ill, 
And the problem with Temperance Lloyd is she is inappropriate. She's got very little what today we'd call emotional intelligence. When she tries to be nice, she comes over as scary. When she tries to be deferential, she can't carry it off. It looks like she's got a chip on her shoulder. And it's a terrible combination. So pr just prior to the incident with the magpie, Grace had recovered. She'd taken the night air when she felt better. She went for a walk around the town with her mates. And Temperance Lloyd had accosted her, fallen to the floor, dragged at her skirts. Oh, mistress, I'm so glad to see you so hearty and so well and so recovered. What she was doing was trying to establish a relationship, trying to do a nice thing. And she probably expected a penny or a halfpenny for a trouble. What happened was the invalid felt threatened. Her private space had been invaded. She was scared of this old woman, and she recoiled. That night, she falls ill again and associates the presence of the beggar woman with a curse and whatever followed. Temperance, on another occasion, is equally unlucky. And th this is part of the... Th the brutal tragedy of her life. She got lucky. For once, she actually had something to sell, and that something was a little basket of apples. Yeah? If we think about the, you know, the famous Disney witch in uh, Snow White, you know, that, that's the kind of image you should have with a basket of apples under the arm. And a rich or a well-to-do young woman and a child came along past the marketplace. The child picked up an apple, took a bite, ran off with it. Temperance follows the child, remonstrating with the mother, you've got to pay for that. And the wealthy young mother thinks it's a great laugh. The child had been cheeky, the child had been naughty. It's all funny, and she shoes the woman away. Temperance gives off, she shouts after them. Within a few weeks, the child sickens and dies. And again, you have the cause and you have the effect and the very, very bad luck. And what we find, to simplify it, with all these three women, is the problems inherent in begging. Unfortunately, if you go out through York today, you'll see exactly the same problems on the streets. How do you beg for charity? Are you completely abject? Do you cajole? Do you do the, you know, the thing, you know, that St. Tony Blair called aggressive begging, you know? Um, how do you do it? And the problem with Temperance Lloyd, and the, the problem with them all is this. If you think about it today, let's use the analogy of being in the streets of York, I think there's a natural impulse to feel guilty that you have when somebody else does not. But you can't give, you can't buy every copy of the big issue that's thrust in front of you. So you've got a sense of guilt, I think. If then you pass that individual by and they mutter something, that can stay with you like an earworm and grow. And I think this is what happens in the case of the Biddeford Witches, that Temperance Lloyd and her sisters do this. And that, if you like, that feeling of, you know, I'll get you and your little dog too kind of thing, goes into the psychology and grows and grows and grows and grows. And when misfortune happens, when the butter refuses to churn, when the cattle sicken and die, when family members fall ill, when the child dies in the cradle, it's attributed to witchcraft. To come back briefly onto what I was saying at the beginning about where this sits in society, the belief in witchcraft is not credulous. It's not the idea of, it's just stupid people who believe this. Biddeford's elites buy into witchcraft. Some of the members of the Royal Society at this time are fighting a rearguard action to justify witch belief across society. It's, the shorthand is it's all caught up with your, your notion of God. Also, if you think about what people read, they're liable to have read the Bible and classical literature of some form or another. What do the Bible and classical literature, particularly if you're reading Lucan or Apuleius, have in common with uh, Saul and the Witch of Endor? They have witches in them. They have a belief in witches. And part of the Anglican church rearguard associated with Charles II's regime and resurgent Toryism 
was this sense that if you began to take out the bits you couldn't deal with in the Bible, where did you stop? Would you end up with atheism? You don't want witches? Then maybe you don't want some of the saints behaving in a particular way. Where do you end up dissecting the Bible? So there's a, there's a theological battle going on at the same time at that kind of level, alongside the street-level problems with charity. And essentially, the, the shorthand is that the battle going on is between those people who see God as being imminent, and by that I mean, you know, the sort of Charlton Heston movie Old Testament God. You know, if he doesn't like you, he'll throw a thunderbolt and you toast. Or the modern, you know, let's characterise it for all we're worth, the sort of... 18th century or modern day Church of England kind of God who's kind of gone absent. You know, he was there in, you know, for the Hebrews, but he's kind of gone missing in action for a bit and he's transcendent. He doesn't work on a day to day way through human affairs. And these two contending ideas about the divine are working their way through society at this point. And the most obvious, the easiest way I'd suggest to lodge a defence on the imminence, the Charlton Heston God throwing the thunderbolts, is through the confrontation between God and the devil through everyday life. So this is, what is, this is what's going on. In Biddeford, the physicians and the apothecaries actively suggest to the families afflicted that witchcraft is actually what's happening. So there are attempts at counter magic, there are attempts to scratch the witches, to draw blood, which would break the charm, and they don't work, unfortunately. So the families have recourse to law. What do they do? How do they prove it? Well, in the case of Temperance Lloyd, she's rushed into the local church where they surprise Ogilvy, the parson, uh, who doesn't, again, he's not where he's supposed to be. He's, he's kind of a bit out of kilter. And he, he suggests they make her say the Lord's Prayer, and she stumbles over the words. Now, it's not surprising she stumbles over the words. If you've got literally a baying mob of your accusers pushing yourself into church, probably, I think, any of us might have trouble remembering it. Add to that her Welsh ethnicity, possibly the fact that English wasn't her first language, and you can maybe see why she stumbled in the way she did. The other thing that they do is they search the women for witch marks, okay? the little polypses, the little nodules that suggested that they had formed a pact with the devil. This was where the, the little familiar, the little demon, would suck milk from the witch, whether it was male or female. And surprise, surprise, because they're old women, Temperance Lloyd had been strip-searched once before in uh, 1679 for the marks, and they didn't find any. Three years later, they do. Setting aside the fact that, you know, this is humiliating and terrifying, um, to use Aldous Huxley's phrase about what happened in Loudoun, it is kind of analogous to, to a sexual assault in a public toilet. You know, this is what's happening to these women, and we can't varnish it. Surprise, surprise, they're elderly. They find polypses on their genitals, okay? And if we think about which persecution, the theorists are peddling a line that says that the witch is not fully human. The moment they have their demonic pact, the moment they sign with the devil, they get their familiar, they get their witch's marks. So their reality is not, they are literally dehumanized. They are something else. They don't have human agency anymore. They're demonic. They're almost like, you know, it's like a vampire movie. They're almost like a different species. So what you do to them doesn't count on the same level. So they've got the proof of the witch's marks. You've got, at the same time, guides to people uh, who are sworn in as jurymen, you know, guide to England's jurymen, etc., etc., that tell you about why this is important, how you can find proof positive of witchcraft. And the other thing that the women do not do this time for various reasons is they don't deny the charges set against them. That's the key thing. Temperance Lloyd, on her earlier uh, trial, had enough sense to deny everything. This time, what happens is Lloyd confesses, stumbles a confession of sorts, 
and Edwards and Trembles drag each other down. They're overheard in the, in the jail at the end of the bridge, uh, basically remonstrating with each other. Well, you did this, you did that. No, 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 why did we have to go there? And that gets them deeper and deeper and deeper into trouble. The story doesn't end there, though. Witch hunters are brought in. There's a couple of them we know about in Biddeford. There may have been more. They're hired in. The guy who is running the show, actually, of the, of the church in Biddeford, a guy called the Reverend Hahn, who is an incredibly slippery character to find in the records, I think does set himself up as a witch hunter. He wants to make his name unmasking a demonic conspiracy, so he's in there. The local authorities at the same time are incredibly scared. The state is tottering. If you think where Devon is, it's only three years before Monmouth raises his rebellion in the West. There is an anti-government underground along that's very real, along with a supposed satanic underground. All the people who had led Biddeford for the previous hundred years, all the great merchant families, by and large, cannot hold on to office anymore because of Charles II's alterations to religion. They're religious dissenters, so they can't be the mayors, the justices of the peace, the common council members in the way they had. They're utterly disenfranchised. So people like the Strange family who'd held um, Biddeford together during the plague, just after the Civil War, the Beers, who were the pottery, uh, great Potter families who made their fortunes, were hunted as dissenters and very often arrested and tried for home church meetings. So the, the natural leaders of the community are not there. There's a vacuum, and all kinds of weird stuff comes into the vacuum. So the justices of the peace want shot. They don't want the privatisation of justice through either the mob or through the witch hunters. And they make up their minds really quickly to get shot of the women to push them off to Exeter. At the same time, two other women, um, Mary Beer and Elizabeth Caddy, are also accused of witchcraft. The problem there is we don't know who and what they were supposed to have done. You know, the difference was they were affluent, they were younger, they had families, and they were married, and they had men to speak for them. The great tragedy about the Biddeford witches is they had nobody to speak to them. At any one point in their story, I think, if one single person had spoken up for them, they'd have probably walked free. And although misogyny is one of the drivers to this case, more potently, it's about in and out groups. It's about young groups of affluent mothers ranged against poor, childless, friendless women. That's what drives, actually, the motor for the case. So what happens? We'll run into the last sort of 10 minutes or so, and then we can go to the Q&A. Um, they're taken off to Exeter. You can imagine Temperance Lloyd had been to Exeter once before. It's, a, it's lifting them out of what they were comfortable with. One of the tragedies of the women was that they weren't mobile. They just didn't have the wherewithal, even when these accusations are hovering over them, to skip the town where the, they begged. They're brought into Exeter in time for the Assizes. There is, and this is, you know, uh, a signal of intent and the workings of 17th century justice, there is a pre-meeting to work out the charges um, that Thomas Hill, who's the clerk of Biddeford, goes to. And essentially, that's where the horse trading goes on. That the cases for Beer and Caddy, the other two women, are quietly dropped, and the three poor women are committed to trial. We don't know, because we don't actually have an account of their trial. All we've got is the pamphlet literature to go on. So we've got stories, for instance, about when the two uh, High Court judges made their entry into Exeter, their horses took fright on the drawbridge into the castle and couldn't move any further. And this was seen in some quarters as a magical act. The witches had spooked the horses. You know? They'd, they'd, you know, they'd called their spirits out and that they were terrified. Actually, how long the trial was is a moot point. When you look at the assizes, we tend to think you know, of modern courtrooms with advocates, with due process with people actually being heard. You look at the volume of the cases, certainly for Temperance Lloyd's original trial in Exeter, 
and you look at how many cases we're going through in a day, and you suddenly realize that probably these hearings were around about five or ten minutes. It's machine justice, guillotining, not that there were guillotines anywhere other than Scotland at that point, but it's guillotining justice. It's a machine that feeds people through. So they probably didn't get much of a hearing. And the key thing is the fact that they admitted it. What else could Judge Raymond, who gets the blame, rightly and wrongly, for what happened, do? Because they'd admitted it. The law books recognised witchcraft as a crime. Scripture said there was a crime. He had, in some respects, to direct the jury to convict. But the story shouldn't have ended there. There are lots of ways round the death sentence. There's lots of horse trading goes on in the 17th century justice system. So there was the room for appeal, you know? The, the appeal papers went up to London. And Lord North, the other judge who later tries to wash his hands of it, writes, I think, one of the most cynical letters I've ever read to the Secretary of State. And he starts off in a very clubbable, very sort of enlightenment fashion. He says, well, you know, we know that only the silly country folk believe in witchcraft. You and I are gentlemen of the world. We, you know, we don't hold with this. So, you know, really, it's all a bit distasteful. However, there is the security of the state to think about, that the West Country is troubled, there are rebels and dissenters waiting to go into arms, and that the hue and cry of the mob is so great in the streets of Exeter and is echoing around the courtroom and the castle that we cannot do anything other for the good of the state to return a conviction on these miserable creatures. Then he goes off into a discussion about the, the various people he's had dinner with and who he's seen in the county, who's loyal to the king, who ought to be preferred. And then he comes up in the killer last paragraph just to reassert the political necessity of the women's death. Okay. So if you're looking for a, you know, a villain in all of this, I think Lord North is one of them, along with Han the witch hunter. However... Nothing quite goes to plan. Han the witch hunter, I'm quite sure, had thought that he was going to get his moment in the sun, that the scene on the scaffold was going to be literally the last act of the play where he could take credit for unmasking um, the workings of the devil and hold the women to account. <sighs> Their way to the scaffold, again, with all of this, you can't varnish it as with anything for people who are on, you know, uh, just about to lose their lives by judicial ex execution, is remarkably vivid. Mary Trembles is so terrified of her impending death that they have to strap her to the back of a mule to actually get her up to Heavy Tree where the sentences were carried out. Conversely, and this I think reflects on her poverty, the ever pragmatic temperance Lloyd is observed in the cart munching on another apple, absolutely unconcerned. And you think this may have been a bit like Turpin, um, the chance to have your last meal, actually to have the comfort of a full belly and to take whatever chances you were absolutely given. They get to Heavy Tree and they're confronted by harm. But they don't do what was expected. They don't give the, the root and branch um, confessions signaling the devil in the way that was acceptable to a witch finder. They garble it. Temperance Lloyd, for instance, is, and one, one of the pamphlet accounts is obviously set down firsthand by somebody who was in the, in the crowd, and he gets the names wrong. He conflates Temperance Lloyd with, with Susanna Edwards. He attributes different bits of evidence to them, but you can, you can tease it out and work out what was said. But Temperance is truly reflective. She says, yes, there was a child with an apple. Yes, I did curse the child, and the child died. I could have been responsible. You know, it's that terrible thing, again, when we think of guilt. If you are reflexive... There is that room for doubt. I might have, 
I might have cursed that individual. It could have sickened them. It could have resulted in something terrible. But I didn't cause a young boy to fall off the mast of a ship. I can't do weather magic. I've never done weather magic. I've never raised storms. I can't do that. So the justices on the scaffold begin to lose their way. And at this extremis, and I don't think there's any other reason to, to assume that this was written after the point, we get, and there's a wonderful feminist writer who used this phrase about why look at witch trials, why look at death and destruction, why we look at this particular form of justice wrought upon women from, you know, what, 1560 to the beginnings of the 18th century. Well, one reason is that, for better or worse, we hear the poor and women in particular talk with an authentic and clear voice in a far surer way than we can in almost any other walk of early modern life. And I'd suggest that this is true with Susanna because as her final request, she suggests that they ought to sing Psalm 40. And it's incredibly reflexive because it's actually saying, I won't read the whole thing out for reasons of time now, but the gist of it is, you can't judge me. Only God can judge me. I've been a great sinner. I throw myself open to his mercy. But you lot are absolutely no better. So if you can imagine the theatre and the drama of that actually happening, it begins to derail the process. Worse still, and this is the horror of it, they do them, you know, as any show trial does, you have the warm-up act first, so they hang Mary Trembles quickly. Then they go on to Susanna. They save the Grand Dam Witch, Temperance Lloyd, last. She's about to go up the ladder. Harness said his piece, railed at her, and she's effectively, you know, sideswiped him, and he can't pursue the questioning anymore. Then, the ch then one of the justices from Exeter turns up, and begins the questioning again, pulls her down off the rung. It doesn't take, I think, much imagination to think of the psychological impact that your two accused are swaying in the breeze above you, and you just want to get to the end of it, and you've got somebody beginning it all again in the last minutes of your life. Did you have a pact with the devil? Well, I met somebody when I was carrying broom, and a dark, you know, a tall, swarthy dark gentleman came to me and offered to take my burden. Did you cause the storms that affected the ships? No, I didn't. I couldn't do that. I don't know how to. Did you make the boy fall from the rigging? No, I didn't. But I did, and she repeats it again, I did scold the child with the apple. And so she goes on to her death. There are a few silver linings in the story, I think. It's an object lesson, an object lesson about poverty, about intolerance, about the way that the marginalised, who in this case happen to be poor and female, are treated in a boom town, in an incredibly rich and otherwise vibrant society. But I think there is a sliver of a silver lining in it, in as much as that the denouement didn't happen because of the women's bravery. Well, there is a kind of bravery, actually, of, of certainly Lloyd and Edwards on the scaffold. They don't allow the witch hunters the last words. They find their voices in a way that they never did at any other point in their lives. And I think that is kind of a, a validation in itself. Because they don't get the killer punch, the witch hunt doesn't grow. It doesn't develop. Hahn, I think, is desperate to export it to Scotland and back to East Anglia, and he publishes a lot in London. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen in quite that way. He's forgotten. He glimmers out. He doesn't become the celebrity witch finder. And I think the final sting in the tale is that when all is said and done in Biddeford today, and I think in wider society, the name of the Secretary of State who signed their death warrants is forgotten, the North brothers are hardly household names, I'd suggest. The justices of the peace in Biddeford 
are, are long gone and in their earth, as are the witches' accusers, but that the only monument to any woman in Biddeford itself is a simple plaque on the town hall where they were sent for trial and interrogated to the three women of Biddeford. And that, I think, in some ways, is posthumous revenge enough. And I'll leave it there, and we can go to Q&A. Um, thank you very much, John, for a really wonderful, engaging talk, um, which gave us such a brilliant introduction to the book. And I can only apologise for my pronunciation of Biz Biddeford, as someone who's very right. firmly from the north. Um, so we have um, some time for audience questions now. I'm sure you've got lots of things you'd like to ask John. Um, so we'll just get started, really. So would anyone like to start us off with a question? Yep, so we have a question down here. And then we'll go there. You'll be happy to hear that I am actually from Biddeford. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and I'm pleased that you mentioned pottery mm -hmm. as a trade, because in the 17th century, that was a very significant uh, trade. And as tobacco was coming in, mm -hmm. a lot of pottery was going out, both to South Wales and the Americas. But my question is, is there any chance, um, given we're not quite sure, it seems, about um, uh, uh, Temperance Lloyd's age, is there a chance that she was slightly demented? Yes, yeah. I mean, that, I mean it's, slightly fu it's a slightly functional answer. But I think senility is a possibility. I think certainly one of the things, because obviously you've got, you've got to compress the story into 40 minutes and you've got to obscure things. One of the other things temperance confesses to is seeing this capering demon. And, and you'll know how steep Biddeford is, you know? that there is a sense of the, the witches seeing everything, knowing everything. Well, if they lived at the top of the town, as the Victorians suggested, you could spot absolutely anything. It would be like a crow's nest up there. So she describes heading up um, Gunner Lane under this load and this thing, this spirit, capering and convorting in front of her, this sort of little ball of energy that was a bit like a toad, possibly, and that is seen as an agent of the devil. Well, you think, well, maybe cataracts. You know, the light is causing this strange thing to dance in her eye, visions. So it's a possibility. We can't prove it, but I think certainly what we know from what Lord North wrote, and his brother wrote, is that they were garrulous, that they couldn't help themselves, and they came up with these fantastic tales. So the short answer is yes. <laughs> it could well have been. And again, it plays into disadvantage, doesn't it? Things that are not understood. I mean, dementia is, is, is a terrible thing with our own society that is problematic and is barely contained. How much more so in the late 17th century when there were simply not that many people who made it into old age? Why did they think that the, the polypses and the, the early onset of ovarian cancer that they were looking at in the women was so extraordinary? Because they didn't have much chance to examine intimately elderly, poor women. So I hope that, that answers it. Thank you. I think we had a question at the back there. So with this being such kind of like a middle ground time for religion and like general ideas and knowledge spreading into even kind of smaller towns, I guess, is it possible that they were like a proxy to push people in either direction? And the reason that they didn't keep going is it had such like, not like a negative feedback, but such like an odd way of being received because of how they acted at the end. Well, I think it, it has been suggested that they were used as political footballs in the battle between Whigs and Tories in the West Country. So that's one valid interpretation. I think because there aren't, there aren't clear cut party political lines in terms of the people who spoke for them or, or stayed neutral, more importantly, um, and those who prosecuted them. I think more importantly, witchcraft takes a long time to die in Biddeford. 
There are accounts of, of witch practices in the Victorian press, of other witch figures in the local workhouses in the, you know, the late 19th century from the area. Um, the history of the town published in 1797 talks about witchcraft within living memory and belief in it being constant. So it's not as if, and there were two other cases that came up after the trials we're talking about today. So the level of suspicion and uh, tension in Biddeford doesn't alter. What alters is the attitudes of the elites that they're prepared to accept it in 1682. They're certainly pre prepared to reject it in 1797. Um, so you've got the disturbance of society. Certainly what does happen, Daniel Defoe visits Biddeford on his great tour, his, his travels of Great Britain, and he gives a lovely account. And it's an account of, a th of Biddeford. It's lost, it's peaked in its prosperity. The tobacco is now going into Bristol. It's losing, you know, it's not supplying all the pottery for the Chesapeake and all the rest of it anymore. In fact, America is one of the great repositories of, of 17th century Biddeford ware, along with um, the, the southern coast of Ireland. Um, but what you get from Defoe is the idea that actually the revolution of 1688 to 89 has sorted things out. Now, that may be a very unfashionable, wiggish view of things today, but there's a certain element that the, the natural leaders of the community reassert themselves because Defoe, in his account, says he ran into the local nonconformist preacher who could now have, a, have his chapel openly, and he chats with him, and it's kind of a staged interview kind of thing. But that guy's father and grandfather had been persecuted. They'd been run into jail, they'd been locked up, they'd died of their, their sufferings. So there's this sense that the world has turned itself the right way up. And I think by the time Defoe is there in the early 18th century you're dealing with an elite that has got its confidence back. People, you've got round pegs in round holes that certainly weren't there in 1682. Are the women a political football? Maybe. I think more importantly is the fact that they were friendless, marginal and vulnerable. I think we can certainly say that. Thank you. So I think we've got another question down here down and then the we'll front. go up to the back. Thank you. Um, we have. Well, I mean, it, it's, it's demonising the other. Maybe you don't call them witches, but maybe you call them something else. You know, that's a fairly common... And the, and the thing that you fear, the thing that makes you feel guilty, is often the main line. And, and, and the other thing about the witches is that they're soft targets. You know, they're really, they really... They can't land a punch on you, either through hiring a top-shot lawyer to ruin you, or through landing the physical punch. All that they can land on you is the curse, the power of their tongue, the power of their imagination, the, you know, the, the power of their eloquence. And that's precisely what gets a woman onto the scaffold. So the easy answer is not in the same way, but I think the tension in our society is that it takes a hell of a fight to remove the witchcraft statutes from um, you know, the legal books. It's only 1951 and the post-war Labour government that gets rid of the last vestige, the Fraudulent Mediums Act. So it's not that recently you could be running for something looking a bit like witchcraft. It's that that allows modern Wicca to flourish. Yeah? So that's, it's that what a, that allows Gerald Gardner to go into print with witchcraft today. I uh, couldn't do that from the censorship before, but the, the key difference is, uh, you know, the European Enlightenment. It makes toleration possible in a way that just wasn't there before. And I think the mistake people make, and maybe the message to take away today, is that it's not a once and for all battle, that every generation has to refight that, 
and make the cause why you shouldn't persecute people for their poverty, for their difference, for their frailties, for their inabilities. And also the fact that if you're dealing with people like the, the Biddeford witches, the, the simple truth is you wouldn't have wanted to have known them. They're not paragons of any kind of virtue. They were fairly unpleasant, as far as you can see, but that doesn't make them evil. And we've got to temper that. We're not dealing with Hollywood movies, where the, you know, the witch is always, you know, we were saying earlier, the beautiful Samantha or Sabrina and her aunts. The difficult, troubled people are what we're dealing with, but they certainly don't deserve to be persecuted, and they certainly don't deserve to, be di to die. And I think you can project that onto any group you want to take away with us in our present. And I think that maybe goes some way to answer that. Thank you, John, for a really brilliant answer to that question. I think we had a question at the back, and then perhaps we'll come down here if that's okay. So we'll go to the um, person at the back up there. So did you just want to wave at us again? So it's, yeah. Oh, sorry, we'll go there, we'll go to the front, the then we'll go There's a lady who's had a hand up. Oh, sorry, go for it, sorry. Oops. Yeah, go yeah. for it. Um, firstly, I just want to say thank you for a brilliant talk. Um, it was really engaging. Um, I think you may have addressed the question a little bit in the last question, but um, you mentioned at the start that this is the last execution for witchcraft in England, but that it goes on a bit longer in Scotland, and I'm no expert, but I hear that in the American colonies, executions for witchcrafts carried on a few decades after this. Mm -hmm. Considering that England and Scotland are neighbours, um, wh why do you think there's this discrepancy uh, in how long executions for witchcraft last? Why do you think it stops earlier in England and Scotland or the American colonies, for example? Different judiciaries, different rules of evidence, the power of the Kirk in Scotland. In the Salem trial that we're all you know, most famous with in the North American colonies, it's the admittance of spectral evidence that had been permitted in a court by Matthew Hale in 1662. And that essentially means that if you are deposing, uh, you know, you're accusing a witch of doing whatever they do, you can say, I can see invisible spirits flickering around. And that has to be accepted as evidence, okay? Later on in the book, when I'm talking about John Holt, the great legal hero who, who rolled back witch persecution in England, among many other things, um, the genius of Holt was he struck out temporal evidence. Once evidence has to be empirical, you're cutting at witch belief. What I would say in all three juries, well, no, not in Scotland, but anyway, um, earlier, but certainly in England and North America, the thing we do have going for us is that we don't allow judicial torture. You talk, you know, that's why you get the great continental hunts. Once you torture anybody, I don't care what people say, they will sing any tune you want them to sing. Full stop. You know, let's get away from Hollywood. You hurt somebody enough, you will get a confession. Full stop, you know? Whether that's Tukhachevsky in a cell in the Lublyanka, or whether it's, you know, um, Mayor Junius in Bamberg in 1630. It's the same way. If you, if you hurt somebody enough, you'll get it. Why do they die out um, at different times? Takes ideas different times to filter. We had Holt in England, removal of spectral evidence. We have to say generational change and the impact of the Enlightenment, which moved at different paces and was in continual tension. So I hope that helps. But it, it's safe to say we've reached a watershed by the early 18th century. So in the case of the witch, witch outbreak in Paisley in Scotland, one of the women who did the accusing of Paisley by the 1730s was a mill owner, was as rationalist and as we would think enlightenment and a woman of business and as modern as we could ever think of. So I think society reaches a kind of watershed where things, I mean, if you, I'll give you a very simple and maybe silly example. Think about the way that drunk driving is seen today, that I don't think anybody in this room would see it as a particularly virtuous or acceptable thing. Go into the 1960s or 50s, and people regularly drank loaded. 
and it wasn't seen as being pernicious. So societal change and generational change is a motor that sometimes does improve things. So so I think we've got one time for one, one more, more and quick then we'll, question. We'll wrap up, yeah. Apologies if you haven't had a chance to ask John a question, but you I think he will be available later. afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. So we did have yeah. an individual at the back who had their hand up for okay. a while. So on the, the left-hand side, just there. Sorry, yep. <laughs> just like <clears throat> quickly, what actually made you want to write this book? Was there anything specific that you wanted to sort of say about the Biddeford witches that hadn't been said before? Or was it just like purely out of interest? Well, I think interest helps anybody, you know, I mean, you're at a literary festival. Some of you have maybe tried to, you know, have written things yourself. If you're not interested, if it doesn't excite you, it's not going to work. You know, you can't write to numbers that the, you know, um, you have, you have to want to do it for yourself. I think, in a nutshell, why Biddeford is important is that it is so late and it is so challenging to all the traditional tropes about witchcraft. So what are those tropes, to begin to end where I began, that it's about stupidity and an unthinking persecution rather than an intellectualised, targeted clinical persecution. It's always about poverty. Well, the women are poor, but they're in the midst of plenty. It's urban, not rural. It's cosmopolitan. The, the, the cast of villains, if you like, are the elites and members of the royal society. The one voice in the wilderness in the mid-17th century is John Webster, who is the sort of equivalent, I don't know, of a sort of new age traveller, sort of 60s hippie, who is completely countercultural in rural Lancashire, member of Cromwell's army, he's a, he's a physician, who writes a brilliant counterblast to witchcraft, but he's seen quite literally by the members of the Royal Society when they denounce him as being common and unlettered and irrational because of his religious enthusiasms. So it's turning everything 180 degrees or looking at it a bit like, you know, the little boy and the Snow Queen. You get that sliver of glass in your eye and the world is distorted and made horrific and terrible by that. That sliver of glass is what ruined the lives of the Biddeford witches and its removal by a comparatively small number of people like Webster, like Justice Holt, who's the great legal hero, um, is all the more remarkable for it. And that, I think, is what we ought to celebrate today. And I think that wraps it up so for you. Yeah? <laughs> thank you very much. So okay. thank you so much, John. So thank you for a really fascinating talk. Um, <laughs> and just to end today, um, so thank you so much, John, for a wonderful talk and for answering so many great questions from our audience members. Um, I'm sure many of you here today will now be really, really keen to get your hands on John's book if you haven't done so already. And just to kind of flag up that it is available to purchase here from our independent bookseller, Fox Lynn Books. Um, and I think John will also be available to sign copies of the book and to answer questions as well afterwards. So thank you, everyone, for joining us today.